chairman of Creative University, one of the founders with my wife, Louisa. And before we begin and introduce Jeff, and we're very, very excited to have Jeff uh, for today's session and take us through his career path and go through many different things, which I think will be really interesting. Let me tell, uh, let me tell you briefly about Creative University and what it's about, who it's for, uh, because many of you are new to it, and I see many who are joining right now um, onto this session. So let me take you through it really, really quickly. Rapid fire. You can find a lot more information on the Creative University website, by the way. So if you go to creative, C-R-E-A-T-V dot media, and look up at one of the tabs, Creative University, and you'll find a bunch of information. So why is that? Why did we create um, this? Because all of you guys out there, it's for you. It's for students, uh, exclusively for students who are college students, high school students who are very interested in, in, and passionate about exploring careers in media and entertainment and tech. And it's a daunting time. And we wanted to create something that is not only gives you the great minds and the great insights of guests like Jeff, but also gives immediate internship, real internship opportunities and mentorships. So you, um, you get into the business right away. And that's always the hardest path. So we want to help you get that. So there's an application process, an easy one, but we want to see who you are, why you're passionate about it. But what it is, as I say here, it's a new kind of entrepreneurial hub for you guys. And it's, it's exclusively for students dedicated to actively exploring careers, as I said, and it's inspired to be a living, breathing thing, which means that those of you who, are, who participate help make it what it becomes. And it's meant to give, as I said, these kinds of opportunities and networking, but it's meant to be democratized. So democratized meaning everybody gives a sh gets a fair shot at these opportunities, so long as you, you show your dedication and passion for the business and really, and really crave to get into it. Um, let me tell you a little bit more. So there's the Creative University website. What we do is we have these live Q and A's like today. Um, our first one a few weeks back ago, a few weeks back was TikTok's new CEO, Kevin Mayer. It was his first interview after taking the reins on June one. And boy, has his life changed from going from Disney to TikTok. TikTok's everywhere and um, right in the line of sight. You all probably use it, but that's the kind of guests we attract. Guests like Jeff, like Kevin, there's a whole host of others. If you go to the new YouTube site for Creative University, search it, you'll see the great sessions all recorded, all on demand, but pretty incredible. We'll have webinars, interactive sessions with students. Um, I'll go through a couple other things, but as I mentioned, mentorships, etc. One of the themes that you'll see throughout in Creative University and all the speakers is the importance of relationships, which are Probably the most important thing is you chart out your career. If you can establish a mentor or relationship early on, that can transform your life. And that's what we wanna do here at Creative University. So our next session, just a little preview, is gonna be not this Friday, the following Friday, August 14th, another great session with Sarah Hardin, who's the CEO of Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine, where she, we'll have a conversation with her and. Sarah's great too, tremendous experience in the business. And then the next couple of weeks afterward, Ann Lee, who's the co-founder and CEO of Sean Penn's, this great movement, um, humanitarian movement called CORE, which is Community Organized Relief Effort. She'll describe her journey and what they're doing in COVID-19 COVID times and uh, the whole social impact aspect of what she does. And also will give you an opportunity to get involved with CORE and with making an impact. Fascinating. And then uh, August 27th, L.C. Crowley, who's the CEO of Trioscope Studios, a fascinating, um, where they blend live action with animation and have shows on Netflix, et cetera. Really interesting. His theme will be developing your own ideas so that your life is enhanced and exciting. Um, and then some future sessions. And I, I want to get your feedback on these. So send a note of your choice to Luisa, L-U-I-S-A, at creative.media, C-R-E-A-T-V.media, where we received comments from many of you that mental wellness, not surprisingly, is first and foremost in everybody's minds or in many of your minds. 
And so we may have some student hosted sessions that discuss that for an open dialogue, which is more going to be an actual discussion. So it won't be in webinar format. And if you think that's interesting, send us a note. But we've heard that from several students. Then we'll get into other things, topics like this, which are more like teaching sessions, but they're interactive. TVs, movies, the state of the industry, state of immersive entertainment, VR, AR, mixed reality, esports, games, live experiential, on and on. Here's some more highlights. If you want this deck so you, I don't have to go through it all, send us a note at Luisa, L-U-I-S-A at creative.media again, and we can send you this deck so you don't have to feverishly be taking notes right now. But these are all really interesting things that I've curated personally for you. Um, including two podcasts that I think are definitely worth listening to. The Prof G Show with Scott Galloway of Columbia, who's just this crusty, fascinating guy. And then Michael Lewis's Against the Rules podcast, which is great, talks about coaching, coaching for you and your life, um, for school, all kinds of things, but it's fascinating. And then I have a spotlight question for those of you who want to reply, and it could be in video form or just send an email. What's your plan for the upcoming 2021 school year? Because obviously it's been massively disrupted. Some of you may be going, some of you may be hi having hybrid sessions. Some of you may be taking a leave of absence or deferring and choosing not to do that. All of that is okay. Nobody has the answers. That's part of the point. And we'll talk about that. So again, if you want to take advantage of these internships and mentorships and break into the business, then help us help you. We need more information from you. Go to the Creative University website, as I said. And then I'm also written a book during these days and I'm giving it away to free for everybody. And it goes through all the different aspects of the business that we talked about or that I mentioned. So it goes through the video side, music side, immersive, live experiential, esports, and games. And I'll make it available. For you and it's um i think it's a good background sounds a little self-serving but it's it's a good background of the business so if you're interested i think it's definitely worth a read so with that i'm going to stop sharing and i'm going to invite my guest uh jeff clanagan to join so jeff there we go I'm on. there he is there he is Jeff, very much thank you for joining today. And, um, and I'll, give you, I'll give a little background to everybody about Jeff. And Jeff, obviously, will let you take us through your career. Okay. But throughout this session, guys, feel free to send questions. I've already received many questions for Jeff, either via the chat down below um, or through the Q&A. And then I'll get to them at various times and we'll ask Jeff. But First of all, again, Jeff, it's great to have you. And I'll, I'll just kind of briefly describe just a few things about your great career. So Jeff is the president of Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud Network and also CEO of Code Black Films. So he needs to have two things going on because he's not busy enough. And then we'll talk about all the, all the mentorship that he does too, by the way, working with young people. But Laugh Out Loud Network is Kevin Hart's comedy network, which reaches now over 100 million people across OTT channels. That's over the top. That's the Netflixes of the world, those kind of um, outlets. And Code Black Films is a film production and distribution company dedicated to super serving the black community worldwide. Jeff, this is just truncated because there's so many things, but Jeff recently broke new ground in theatrical film marketing with his digital first approach to the successful re release of Tupac Shakur's biopic, All Eyes on Me. It generated over $40 million in box office. And we'll get into how you did that, Jeff. And he began his career, interestingly enough, as a concert promoter, promoter for HBO Def Comedy Jam Tour and NWA Straight Outta Compton Tour. And Jeff, this is something we didn't discuss. NWA has a special place in my heart because when I started off as a young entertainment attorney, my biggest client and my biggest case was an end. It was for NWA. Oh, wow. So this is it, and and uh, actually, and I won't get into why NWA 
actually was the reason how I met my wife, Louisa, and we're still married today. Wow. Wow. I, you know, 20, let's see, almost 30, 27 years later. So we, sh we definitely share that. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, first of all, before we begin, why did you choose that song, the Mary J. Blige song, to start us out today? I just wanted to, you know, I wanted just something upbeat and just, you know, because I, in my playlist, and I, you know, when I'm working out, I have all, I have everything from jazz to hardcore hip hop to political hip hop. So I just wanted something upbeat. Um, didn't want to necessarily send too much to any messages in my songs. So I just wanted something upbeat. It's a great song. It's a, it's a fantastic song. So I walked everybody through just a very high level of your career. So let's take that through first, because I think for the students out there, you know, this is all meant for them mm -hmm. so that they understand different from different voices, from different roles within the industry um, and give perspective, which may expand what they think they might want to pursue, but also how to do it, how to get into it. And so tell us a little bit about how you began as a concert promoter and how you even made that first step into the business. Okay. Um, to be honest with you, my, my entrepreneurial roots date all the way back to high school. Um, what happened is, now when I was in high school, what I thought I was gonna be doing was playing pro football, because I played, I was sport, very active in sports, and then end up in a marketing role. I, was, I grew up in Silicon Valley and working for Hewlett Packard or IBM or Apple or something like that. That's, that's what I, felt my trajectory would be. Um, one day a friend of mine in another school, his parents were from Jamaica. They were going out of, they were going out of, out of Jamaica for a couple of weeks. So he said he was gonna have a house party. And I, the school I went to was a very popular school. He was at a school that didn't necessarily have a big school population. So he just basically said, hey, look, can you get a bunch of people from your school to come to this house party and I'll split the door and we're charging a dollar. Like, yeah. So he gave us the flyers. Um, the street got blocked off, police came, blocked us off, but we had like, I think we made, we made probably $150. So it was like a dollar a piece because that's all we could get in the house. That started me on a trajectory with him in high school where we started doing more parties, obviously not necessarily in the house. We started renting out places. We started doing skating parties. And at that time for me, it was just, I never thought of it as a career path. It was just something fun to do. Um, what what kind of parties did you say? Like skating parties and stuff like that. We do we have skating rinks. Like you saw in there, we do skating rinks, all, all of that stuff. And then that, that just that started me on a career path where we do these parties. But what I found out is that in doing that, I had a knack. At that time, I didn't know what it was called, but I had a knack for marketing, especially in direct to consumer and reaching people and getting people to do stuff. Um, the way we did our flyers and stuff like that. So I started liking the, the marketing side. Um, when I got to college, I went to University of Washington, went to play, went to play ball. Um, I hurt my knee, so I stopped playing ball because I had a number of injuries. I had two broken um, ankles, broken finger, knees. So, so I was like, one more injury. I'm like, ah, let me focus on the business. I was major in the business. So when I went to Washington, to Seattle, I was still doing parties, but now the parties were a thousand people, fifteen hundred people. Um, it did to that in Seattle. So Seattle. By the way, let me let me just start on that because you started with house parties very young and you didn't really have a plan. You just did it. You know, you, <laughs> as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneurial guy, you just did it. So then, when you went to college and you had these house parties that or these parties that were a thousand, fifteen hundred people, how did you do that? How did you make that leap? So, so what I learned on the way, probably what I skipped, is that obviously in high school when I started renting a skating rink or started in the hall, I'm under 18, so I couldn't even sign a contract. So either um, I had a partner, either my father would come sign a contract or his father would come sign a because I couldn't sign, I'm under 18, so I couldn't even sign an agreement. Um, but addition to that is that I had a friend whose father was program director of the big radio station. Um, um, he was a program director of the big radio station of the Bay Area. And he actually taught me because I actually bought, I started buying radio time to do promotion. I know, you know I'm not, I'm, at that time in high school, I don't know anything about marketing or advertising, but he basically showed me the ropes and how to buy radio, but I still would have to have my father come sign the agreement because I can't, I couldn't sign the radio contract. Right. But I actually learned how to buy radio. I learned how 
the inner workings of a radio station work from a marketing standpoint. So I was, I was learning marketing along the way and not really knowing that I was getting school on marketing. So with, it also enabled me, I learned negotiation just by, by virtually doing it in terms of negotiating the buildings. I had to buy insurance. So this is all under 18. I'm like, I got to go buy insurance. I got to negotiate the building. So I just, I learned, it was practical learning, not something that I learned in school, but because we were doing it and doing it, it kept getting bigger and bigger. I started learning by trial and error. And obviously I made mistakes, um, but it was trial and error. So by the time I got to college, you know, I, I had, I was pretty grounded in terms of knowing what to do, going down to a hotel and negotiating for the barroom or going to the trade center and getting the trade center to a party and knowing how to buy insurance. So I had, I was pretty experienced through, from my high school years, from in actually in, in obviously being under 18, understood how radio works. Um, Which by the way is, a, is a, an important lesson for everybody out there too, because it's another theme that we've had with all the speakers where there's not necessarily, there's rarely a plan where somebody intends to go for, knows where they're going to be going with this. Kind of start out organically, but takes action in some way. It could be a small step. And ultimately, um, it's almost like no step is too small because in each part of it, you learn something that you can then take to the next one. And so you have a little bit of experience and it builds, 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 builds. So don't feel that you need to have the biggest role on day one. In fact, be ready to take the, any role that is going to be a positive learning experience. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to learn and get educated in school, but then you're also, it's the practical experience of doing things. And it's, it's step by step. Like these are over years. You, you learn and you learn and you try to have also try to have good people around you. What positioned me to transition to concert promotion and music was, so in college, um, just so happens me and my, um, I had two, two high school buddies. We all went to Washington. Um, one, of my, um, one of my buddies was an attorney. And when we were doing the parties, we were also DJing the parties too. So I was like, it's the DJs, <laughs> we, we trade off a of DJ. Um, what we did is, because one of my other partners was major in communication, so we actually got a radio show on Sundays and it was an FM signal that basically blanked all of Seattle. And that was the only kind of urban hip hop station that day was when we did uh, on the, um, on the on the show, we started getting DJ pools starting sending us records. So it started sending us records. Now here we are, we had a three bedroom apartment, and we we our bedroom was stock. We have no living room furniture, but we had hundreds of records, turntables. That was like our that was like. So we started getting these records. The DJ pools, hey, we get records because we were spinning on the on the radio show and also doing the parties. So at at, that, at some point. We basically maxed out on parties and hey, we and this is when hip hop was starting to come. So let's start trying to book X. Now, once again, I know nothing about booking X. So all we did was we would take the record, look on the number the on the on the record, call the number on the, on the record label, like, oh, and hey, this is um Jerry Heller, you know, Easy's manager. And then we call, hey, this is Russell Simmons, because they was they were small and coming up. So a lot of times they would answer the phone. So we booked Run DMC and all the early hip hop acts. And so what we would do, we were still doing parties, but we would have a rap act come to um, and perform at the party. Now, I think what's real important because I've thrown the term contra promoter around and probably a lot of people hear it, but understanding what a contra promoter has to do, and this, this is kind of what led me to kind of, I think my skills to what I have now. Being a contra promoter is like, you know, everybody on this, um, on the chat's probably been to a concert, but you probably really have no idea what goes on behind the scenes to get that concert to fruition to get you there. So what happens as a concert promoter, you have to book the, the venue, whether it be the arena or the theater, you have to book the theater, you have to hire a crew, which a lot of times is union, and you've got to deal with the crew rates. You have to be able to call in the agents and book the acts, mm -hmm. um, negotiate favorable rates, you then have to, you, you've locked in your building, you're locked in the act. Now you have to market and sell tickets. So you gotta go to the radio station, you gotta do flyers. So you, you wear, as a promoter, you wear a lot of hats. So when you I try- also, You take the risk. You take, and you take the risk. The other big thing is you take a lot of risk with a contra promoter. So yeah. you have to understand the numbers and the budgeting because if you overpay for an act, you could have a sold out show and lose money. 
So you have to, so you have to put your math skills to test because you, you, you can lose them. I mean, contra promotion is, is a very, very risky business. Um, but that's what led me into contra promotion. And then from that run, especially during the mid eighties or nineties, I did pretty much every big hip hop tour, including the NWA tour that was in that tour that was in the movie, the Run DMC tours, LL Cool J's, um, Will Smith when it was Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, you know, all, all, all of those. Um, so it just kind of, it, it just kind of organically snowballed. Yes. Into bigger and bigger and bigger sorts of things. Exactly. Now, what, but what, from a position standpoint, the reason I was able to build that business is that there were a lot of big promoters at that time. Like now, you know, you have your AEG, your Live Nation, but there were the equivalent these big promoters. They didn't understand hip hop. So what enabled me to get in is that they didn't understand the music or even how to market. It wasn't until it really, really got commercial where they kind of jumped in. So that's what enabled me to really build um, my career around the, around the business is, is with hip hop because they were just behind the eight ball. So mm -hmm. up to that point, it sounds like you started off very small and it just built, built, built. It wasn't necessarily that, um, uh, well, for, first of all, before I ask you that question, one of the things that I think was really interesting, I think is very important for the young people out there to understand too, is the lesson of what you did is you looked at the, you know, you looked at the records and you saw the names and you would literally just call them up. You didn't yeah. have a, con you didn't have a connection into them. No. And, and one thing I have found and I continue to find is that people are afraid to believe, or they, they don't believe that they can get through to somebody. And it's pretty amazing to me that you'll be surprised, guys, that you'll be able to break through more than you believe. You're going to have a lot of non-answered calls or emails, perhaps, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try because you'll surprise yourself. 90% of the people out there do not try because they don't believe they can break through. But if you're tenacious, that does pay off ultimately. And, and Jeff, you're a great example of, of that. Um, by the way, just uh, one of the students from Creative U University was telling me that when she was in high school, she actually reached out to the uh, CEO of Live Nation and just out of the blue, had no connection, just did a code e uh, cold email into him, Michael Rapino, and actually ended up getting an internship out of that. Yeah. So there's another great lesson. Anum, if you're out there, that's you. That's, you. that's your story, which is great. But one of the things, Jeff, you were saying when you were going through all that, it's kind of, well, I'll ask you there. So was there anybody in particular up to that point that, uh, that catapulted your career or was that really just self-made on and on? Or was there a mentor at that point? Yeah, there, there, was, there was actually two. So part of that, so in getting to um, hit back, you know, so once I started getting bigger, then also then I needed to start dealing with the agency so the agencies you guys may hear the same agencies that deal with film it's william morris it's icm it's things like that so because i you know obviously i'm, I'm getting bigger so i had to start calling agencies to book x so true story um and we laugh about today so there was an agent named phil casey he was the head of music at icm icm by the way is one of the biggest talent agencies yeah. out there guys he basically had pretty much all the x i called his office every day for three months straight. He never picked up my call. His, but I got, because I kept calling his assistant, took an affinity to me, okay, Jeff, I'm gonna try, try. But I literally, I called for three days straight. Finally, he said, pick up, what do you want? Because <laughs> he just got irritated, because I just came, because remember, there's no internet, there's no emails or no nothing, it's just, yeah. Call. So, he had an act, which is back then, it was called, her name Lisa Lisa Coljan. And when I called, I was, I wanted, you know, I was calling to book the act. And it just so happened that he had a promoter that was doing a show in Fresno. And the show was in 10 days and the promoter dropped out. So he said, look, I'm going to give you the show. It's in 10 days. Now, obviously, that's, that's like a doomsday scenario. There's no way you can pull that off. He gave me the show. I drove down to Fresno, which I had never been to Fresno before, got a hotel, got the radio, and that was like the history was a huge success. He became my biggest fan and biggest mentor. He was ahead of the agency and music. Once I pulled that off, he just started feeding me all kinds of stuff. He basically mentored me. He also 
he also connected me with bigger promoters like uh, Al Heyman and Bill Graham, which was then, uh, which is now Live Nation. He started, he really started connecting. So he was probably the catalyst in terms of really catapulted uh, my contract career, just because I, because he, he, I knew when he sold me the show in 10 days, he didn't think it was like, you know, I was just kind of like, just, um, okay, I got to get somebody on the show. This guy keeps calling me, let me just give it to him. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Meek Snyder just texted saying that, loves that story, loves that story. But, um, you know, again, there, there you go, is that just tenacious, just tenacity. And all of you out there, really, you, you're, you're probably going to get re ignored or you'll feel rejected many, many times. Believe me, uh, it sounds like, Jeff, you faced it, but I certainly have faced it on and on throughout my career. But you just like, but then when you least expect it, something breaks through, like this opportunity for Jeff, which trans it sounds like it transformed your career, really. It did. It's promoted. It absolutely did. Because he didn't start to give me with the big acts, the new additions and the yeah. kids on the blocks. But like, like he put, he just really elevated my career. Gotcha. Okay. And then where did it go from there? So I kept doing concert promotions. Um, I got tired of, to be honest with you, I didn't really like the concert promotion business. I liked the marketing of it. But then I always, always had an appetite to get into film. Why, why didn't you like the con for those who are interested in the concert promotion, <laughs> what didn't you like about it? The risk, you can lose a lot of money. Now, luckily I got to make more of my lives, but you know, I took, you took hits. I mean, you took, that's where you, it's, it's a very, very, it's a very, very risky business. And what happened was, Unless you own real estate, when I mean by real estate, so when you think about the bigger range, let's say, I'm not sure everybody's, but let's say Staples Centers or Madison Square Garden in New York, Staples Center in LA, the concert promoters control those venues. So what happens is that when you go to rent those, those venues, you might, you might have outbid that promoter on an act, but since they're controlling the venue, they're going to get you in a venue with charge and stuff like this. So unless you got into the venue management business, which, which essentially is what AEG and Live Nation, who are the two biggest promoters, they control real estate and they control these venues. So if you're an independent small promoter, you got to go to them to rent the venue. Um, and they can block you. So it's, it's, it's real, it's a cutthroat business. I mean, it's, it's very cutthroat business. I wouldn't recommend anybody going to concert promotion. I mean, especially <laughs> now, it's even harder as an independent because Live Nation AG control everything. That's definitely true. Um, but if, but go if you like it, you want to go work for AG or go Live Nation private. It's, it's definitely a good one. Right. Okay. So then, because of that, then you were you changed course a little bit. Well, yeah, I wanted to get. So the way what I've always done in my career is I feel knowledge and education about whatever you're going to do is the key to success. So you always have to, to learn that or, or study and, and, tra and learn that craft. So I wanted to get in the TV and the film. Now, I didn't know nothing about TV, but I know nothing about production. But what I did know is I've got all these music contacts on my speed dial I can just call up. So the entrepreneur said, I want to learn production. So at that point, that's when music videos were in their heyday. Um, so what I did is I went to, um, I went and I actually worked for a video production company so I could learn production. I could, I could literally learn production. And frankly, it was, a, it was a company in the Bay Area. They didn't really know my background in terms of my connections, but I went in as the bookkeeper just to get in. After all that you oh, had really accomplished, you, you, because you wanted to learn so badly, you were willing to do that. I was willing to do it. So I went in as the bookkeeper. So that quickly, so once I got in there, so what they would do is I would sit with the director when he's editing, I would go on a set and I would just sit in the shadow and better than learn all the stuff of learn the production. So finally, and I still didn't really, I hadn't led on to really what my big background with it was because I had different, <laughs> different, like, I had an agenda going in. So I said, so then I said, hey, if I go find me a director, I want to go out and get music videos. Yeah, Jeff, yeah, fine. So we went back and forth for much. They finally said, okay, because I kept bugging them. They finally said, okay, Jeff, go find a director. It was kind of a joke, right? I found this director who had just graduated out of film school. Um, and I'm going to jump back and forth. Who ended up becoming one of the biggest music video directors. And he's a 
big commercial director. His name is Dave Meyer. So if you go back to the music videos, he's one of the biggest music video directors out there. But he does, when you see the Apple commercials, so like, he's a huge commercial director. So I found him out of film school. He had never did a video. Got him, made a call at E40. E40, he needs a video. All right, Jeff, cool. I got a guy, did a video. Guy did a good job. That kind of going. So all of a sudden, um, I'm now, I'm now, and started generating more money with this new director than they were making with the other director. So that transition right out of bookkeeping, I brought in more directors and I started becoming directors and I started basically producing and managing these video directors. I bet it transitioned out of being a bookkeeper. <laughs> you were, you were the guy who was bringing the big, you know, the I big money. During that time period, one of the people we started doing business with, which was actually, this is running on BET right now, No Limit Chronicles, there's a whole documentary on it right now, is Master P. I had knew him from before from my concert days. So I, I just happened, I, it was just an arbitrarily, I bumped him into him at a sound stage in LA and we hadn't seen each other in four or five years. Hey, this is my director. He said, well, Jeff, I got three music videos I gotta go right now. So did that, we did the music videos. So all of a sudden the music video director, now it's just, I'm at, at Pete. Now this is like, this is something for me was just, I'm trying to figure out how to get in the film industry, but obviously the music video directors was a way for me to do it because I learned physical production. Not that I ever wanted to be a physical producer, but I feel like if you want to be a producer, you have to learn what everybody on your team is doing. So if you're going to manage a production, you need to know what every, every, every position is. Um, from there, that's when Master P was on his climb to the top. He didn't say, hey, Jeff, I want to start a film company. You want to come run it? No, once again, I got no background running the film because I'm like, but yes. Um, relationship, 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 the power of relationship again. And, and then going back a second to what you said, the power of kind of setting your ego aside when you had done all these great things on the music, in the music world as a promoter, and then you realize you want to try something else. So you're willing to take a bookkeeper role, which immediately then, because you were tenacious and made things happen, evolved into all these things. So, and, and you know, the, and the, that, the thing to that is that, see, I was willing to take a role just to get inside because I knew once I got inside, I could do what I do. So they never, sometimes you have to figure out how just to get in. Yeah. And once you get in, if you're a star and you do your thing, perform, you'll get the opportunities. Come. But I, that for me, that was just an entry into that business. By the way, just one small note on that, Jeff. Um, because we've only been doing Creative University for two months now, very mm -hmm. organically, by the way, very organically. But there have, been, um, there have been several students who have really been dedicated to it. Okay. And it's kind of a similar story. And because they've been dedicated to it and they've demonstrated what they can do, already some job opportunities, internship opportunities, being on TV and interviewed about Creative University opportunities. So again, it's, it's what you said. It's the lesson of, you know, everybody out there, that's the purpose of what we're doing here is to give immediate opportunities for those who really want it. But anyhow, go ahead. Um, so from there, and like I said, part of this, I'm gonna give you the story, but this is actually playing out on BET right now because there's a No Limit Chronicles. There's a whole documentary on the Master P story, which is actually playing every Wednesday. So from there, Master P said, hey, I want to start a film company. Come run it. Like, yeah, okay, boom. So <laughs> tragic is not that. And now I'm president of No Limit Films. Now, you say, what does a film company do? Ah, I don't know. So <laughs> what I did, so I quickly, this is this is part of, and you'll see this part of I've done this through my career. Quickly got a bunch of books, started reading about film company, what to do, what to do, quick come up with a business model. We were also still producing a lot of music videos, so that's where we were getting the bulk. But then at, at some point, Mash P said, okay, look, because he used to fund his own stuff. I want to start making movies. Jeff, I need you to go out, set up distribution so we can get these movies out. First, he said, I want to get in the theater. So call every studio in town distributor didn't even get past the receptionist. Like it couldn't get him. I could not get a meeting. Even though Master P was big, I could not get a meeting. Um, and went back. He said, well, Jeff, okay, look, because the way P was like, I'm making this movie. You need to go figure out how to get it distributed. Like just figure it out. So I was like, okay. Let me think about it. So <laughs> what I did was 
um, and this is before the studios, this is, this is key here because, because the studios were not in the business yet. So what I did is I went to all the record stores. Now, a lot of people on this panel may not even know the record store is because <laughs> there's no more records because Apple's a record store, but we had physical record stores like Tower Records and Warehouse Records and um, Circuit City and Best Buy that sold CDs. I went to the record stores and I said, look, we're going to make these videos straight to straight digital and DVDs for the beach. We're going to make these videos. Will you sell them? At first they said no. Then I just kept going back. I said, look, you got to sell millions of millions of dollars of music for Max P. I just need you to take these videos. I need you to merchant, which is key. I need you to merchandise them on the shelf next to the CDs. And here's what I'm going to do. Typically in the business, when you, when you're selling to a retailer, they'll offer you a per, you know, a price and then they buy it and, taking certain money use that. And I told him, look, I'm going to give you the movies for free on consignment. You're going to pay me nothing up front. I just need shelf space. But in return for that, you got to give me 85%. But I'm going to give you the thing on consignment. Well, that was the beginning of the straight to consumer business, straight to video business. Really tight. That was the beginning in two and a half years. We did like $44 million in just home video business and you just made you just made that up you just kind of it didn't you, exist. You, right because you might know you remember when the, when there was a video business and was blockbuster you rented the video you didn't buy the video it wasn't for sale at the store and if you kept the video out too long you got you had um, penalties and it's fifty dollars to bring it back right, right. there was no straight to video business or straight to home or consumer business that it just, it didn't exist. I just made it up because I said, I just, the, the logic was, okay, look, if they're selling the CDs, where well, the consumer is coming to buy the CD would probably buy the movie from the same artist if they see it merchandising. And, that, and key is merchandising is that they're merchandising together on the shelf. So that, but there wasn't a model. That was a model um, I created. It did, it just didn't exist. It, yeah. Um, so that's, that's the key. And, and that's the thing. I think the thing is, is that even like, in today's, you've got to be creative, you've got to be flexible, and you've got to just not be afraid to try new models um, of what works. But that set me on a path. And by the way, on, on, and that's, a, that's another really important point for everybody who's out there is that, um, you know, just like you wanted to understand all the different aspects of the business, production, distribution, all these kinds of things as you were getting into, whether it was music at first, but ultimately, all the different facets of the of the movie business too and the video business it's real it's critical as technology has continued to transform everything out there to for even if you're think you're just a creative type understanding all the different kinds of ways that consumers can now engage with content and having a good understanding of of as a broad uh, you know a broad sense of the business and where it's also going because then it will it will make you smarter in all your conversations and will help you get uh, more opportunities that way plus you just need to know it but it, go ahead exactly no I, I, absolutely i mean i think you have to um you have to be a student of the business and you have to know what all you know what all the different platforms are but you got to study i mean you want to whatever you want to get into you have to study so from the master p and i broke off and started my own company i'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit because um company called Arbor Works. So it was straight to DVD distributor. I just wanted to part what I did is I went and partnered with a, um, a physical distributor because I don't want to get the physical things like look, you distribute you push these DVDs out of the stores. I'm gonna create the DVDs. I'm gonna acquire the content. Um and that was really the the, the start of what I call my my distribution career. Because what I did is one of the things when I came to Hollywood is that I, when I, part of one is I always wanted to be a creative producer, but then I, I figured out quickly is that that means I got to run around to the studios every time and pitch. And I didn't like, that's not my personality. I'm not, I'm not the bubbly guy that's going to be pitching all this. I'm not, I'm not the pitch guy. You seem pretty bubbly. No, I'm not, I'm not the pitch guy. I'm more the, the business closer. So I said, look, I said to myself, I have to just, I want to be on the distribution side. I want to control my pipeline because then I can just greenlight my own products. Even though it's straight to DVD, at least I have my own distribution pipeline that I can then, I can then um, um, push out and control. So 
in doing it, I created a couple of franchises like the Platinum Comedy Series, which I have Dave Chappelle, Cedric Tanner, and Steve Harvey. Um, and, I, and then I created, I sold that company and created another, and I sold that company after seven years. So we were doing seven years. Created Code Black, which I created 15 years ago and went into a partnership with Universal Music Group, not the, not the studio, because they were getting, because they were getting into physical, they were under the create a, a physical DVD distribution um, unit, which they did. Yeah. Um, so I created that. Then over the, over the course, you know, I'm talking about I distributed probably 200, 250 music videos. But what happened there is that's when I met Kevin Hart. So I met Kevin Hart about 11 or 12 years ago. Kevin um, had just come off of doing his special. He wasn't big yet. This was the small Kevin in the clubs and things. He still wasn't big. Actually, when I met him and the way I met him, I was doing a series that I, um, that I created. I was partnered with Shaquille O'Neal. We created this series called the Shaq All-Star Comedy Jam. We would promote and create these comedy shows during NBA All-Star Weekend. And we had an output deal with Showtime. They would stream on Showtime. And we put them on a DVD. We were doing the first one, and it was on a it was on a Thursday, and one of my opening acts fell out. So I have a booker, and the booker is just a guy that goes helps finds talent for me. He said, "Hey, there's this guy Kevin Hart." And I like, uh, I didn't really, I kind of knew he wasn't big. I said, "Just go and book him because it was the opening act." So Kevin opened the show on that Saturday, and basically turned it out. So what I did in the editing when I edited the show for Showtime, I went back and I put Kevin as the closer in the editing. Because, you know, the people watching TV wouldn't know. So it looked like he closed the show with all these other big comedians. That was the start of a relationship because that show blew up. It well, kept- and, and, and Kevin must have loved that. Yeah, oh yeah, he does. Yeah, there, there's actually, he's, there's a, um, if you go on YouTube, he just did a Joe Rogan um podcast he talks about it how it impacted his career he actually talks about it um he loved it because it blew up and it put him in a different lane all of a sudden at that time he was doing clubs he might do one or two a night he started booking like five days in a row like just that showtime exposure and there that kind of blew up. so that started our relationship through the years and then i did his next comedy special um which thinking so i started doing business with kevin but i think really where the where the relationship with kevin took off is that we did the next special we did in LA. It's called Laughing My Pain. So we shot the special. We shot it really big. We said, oh, we think this can go theatrical. So first I, first thing I did is I went back to my distributing partner, which was Universal Music Group, said, hey, look, we just shot this standard special. Give us the money. We think we can take this out theatrical. They just say, uh, no, we don't think so. They, they just, they literally didn't believe in it. So I then set up, because Kevin was buzzing at the time, I then set up screenings at Sony, Warner Brothers, Lionsgate, a number of studios. Um, We went around town, we screened the movie. Everybody said no, except for Lionsgate. But Lionsgate said, ah, we're willing to try it, but we think it's only three markets. So me and Kevin like, nah, we think it's bigger than that. Now, simultaneously, I was working with Kevin in the social media. Kevin wasn't on social media. So we had started working the social media. He was one of the first guys in like really doing it. So we started building a social media at the, at the same time. And My, that really came from, and that getting into social media, it sounds like that came from you to really yeah. pursue that kind of an opportunity, yeah. which probably flowed from your background in marketing from exactly. the very beginning, so young, young kid. Exactly. So he went and so we, we, had, we had been building a social media and started going. So. So thing here is that, so basically the story is that we got no from everybody around town with this special. We shot the special, everybody said no. So we basically, me and Kevin put our money together. I went to AMC theaters directly and they had just started this program called AMCI, which is AMC Independent. I cut a straight distribution deal, cut out all studios, all distributors and cut a straight distribution deal um, with AMC to distribute the movie. We, when I say distribute, we packaged the movie, the posters, sent the, sent the reels. I, we, it was like really physical distribution. So we distributed the movie for AMC, I, and we had a very, very limited marketing budget. Like, we were just coming, we basically went our own pocket, but it was a very limited marketing budget. Movie blows up, $20,000 per screen average. 
we end up doing, and then we expand to more theaters. All the other, the, all the other theaters start calling. We end up doing like eight million dollars on this, which was a huge at that time for yeah. a small comedy show. So we did that. Phones are just blood blowing up, right? Everybody's calling us. Um, that led to my my deal with Lionsgate because, see, the key here is that anytime you walk into a place in any in any negotiation or any le leverage. If you can say no and walk out, you have all the leverage, especially if you feel that you can do it yourself. So in that situation, went to Lionsgate, shopped it, they kind of they put an offer on the table. We didn't like it. I said, no. I said, we're going to do it ourselves. And doing it myself, that led to then a big deal for my co-black films at Lionsgate, which I was there for literally eight, eight years doing that. But, but, but it was because we decided, it was that hustle kind of, I think that consequence of we decided we're going to do it ourselves. I had never put out a movie theatrical. Yeah, so, but well, yeah. and it sounds like that's a recurring theme of your career where you it's not like you had it all mapped out. In fact, you didn't have it all mapped out no. at all, like throughout your career. And so everybody out there, again, don't feel like you need to know exactly where you're going for your next step or yes. even the first step. Just take that first step. And just like Jeff took a bookkeeper's role, which was a significant step downward, probably most people on the outside would think that given where he was. Because of his tenacity and innovation, he was able to transform that very early on. And it led to a pretty amazing thing. And where, and then you also were faced with these constant impediments of, okay, they don't want to do it. They don't believe in this. So you just found a way. And you didn't have a roadmap. You just yeah. found, you found, found a way. And by the way, people send your questions in. We uh, want to make sure we have time for that. I have um, several questions that were brought to me, but continue on and then we'll start opening it up for questions. Okay, yeah, just so I went quick. So one of the things I'll say during that time period because I really got heavily involved in social media and digital, what I actually was doing also, even when I was with Master P, I started going like, I went back to UCLA, I would, I would take these um, classes, they have a night like new media classes, digital classes, distribution classes. So I was continuing educating myself so i would go take these classes i actually and then i went back to harvard twice to their their executive program i went um two years in a row where you go out there for like 14 days you're in, and you're doing these crash courses i took the new me and digital class so throughout those years i was actually taking where i felt i was deficient at or didn't know i was taking classes so i took a, i took a class I used to like on film distribution i took a class on international i took a class on um, on film financing and things like this. So I was continuing, and, and I think that's, what's, that's probably more important than everything I've said here is that I wasn't too old or too afraid. So I, let me go back and keep learning because I, I need, I know what I don't know. So, and I know I'm in the space, but I, I went and learned and got that information. Um, yeah, yeah I'm mean, so important, guys. So important. That's such a great lesson where just keep reading stuff, just skimming stuff, going through certain things. So you learn as much as you can and even just learn the vocabulary and the players in the business and some of the businesses in it. And then it will spark some ideas just like Jeff for you, because that constant learning you made, you created solutions to problems where others didn't even know it, it hadn't even entered their mind. Exactly. And then, you know, the thing is, and here I said, I'm going to wrap it up so we go up with questions, is that one of the things for me, what, what, what probably what I follow the most and what inspires me the most, I grew up in, in the Bay Area. So I'm a, I'm a really like, I love tech. That's what I always thought I was going to end up at. What happens when you look at the entertainment industry, let's say I'm going to do two things. So if I look at the music business, okay, the, the model for the music business has been turned upside down from physical to digital. But that transition for physical to digital was not led by the music companies. And that's part of the problem is they didn't pay attention to trends. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was Napster, it was MP, MP3 when it came, but Steve Jobs, Apple had those amazing, and when he created the iTunes store, that literally flipped the business model. So the whole music industry, the model has been flipped by a tech company out, out, of, um, out of the Bay Area. Yeah. When I look at the film industry, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about the entertainment business. So we've got Netflix, you've got Google. Where are they from? They're up in the Bay Area. That's what I follow. That's what I'm more following daily than I am following the entertainment trend because these new technologies or these new streaming, but, you know, 
you know, Google, YouTube. I mean, YouTube, that literally is the biggest network in the world. No question. I mean, that, that's the thing. Like, the, the, the media and entertainment business has been completely tech transformed. And you and I talked about a little bit just yesterday about some of the players and all the, you know, the streaming wars that are going on right now. And back, back in the day, and you might remember this, um, small plug for one company I used to work for. I was president of a company called Music Match. I don't know if you remember it, Jeff, but everybody, guys, everybody had that software on their computers at the time. We invented the on-demand streaming game at the time. And it's when, and that was when nobody believed that streaming would be anything because they felt, even Steve Jobs felt that consumers would want to own their music. When at the end of the day, look at where we are right now, streaming leads to 80% of the revenues generated by the business. And the business is supposed to be doubling, no, more than doubling, go from $20 billion to $45 billion by the end of this decade, the recorded music business. But let me, um, I, I want you to finish up and then we'll- I think that you can open up because I, I, okay. I can't cover that. I'll open it up to some questions. First of all, um, Kristen, uh, Kristen said, this is the best. I love hearing those stories. So, you know, that's very inspiring. Here's a, here's a question from um, Yin. My name is Yin, watching with Meek. Is Jeff mentoring? I'm a law student's son and also a licensed talent agent using booking commissions to help pay for law school. How do you get a mentor like Jeff into your life? <laughs> Any special treatment for a Bay Area? I'm not putting you on the spot, by the way. Not putting you on the spot. But why don't the broader question of how best to get mentors or to create that kind of relationship? Um, I, you know, you have to network. So for example, like for example, just coming to this, this webinar right now, you're, you're starting a network and you're getting exposed to people, I mean, you have to do things like this where you can, where you can potentially um, meet people, um, ask questions, and potentially they could potentially lead to other relationships or questions. I mean, I think you know what Peter's doing right now is is, is great. Like, and I'm, I'm going to support it 100. percent Like, if there's you know if there's opportunities going forward, you know, mentorship through through Create TV, I'm I'm totally down on board to do it. Yeah, I mean, look, guys, it's um, you got to want it, really, because we're we're here to help, and Jeff is part of this and is on this mission because we all this is for you guys, this is for you guys. But um, just like Jeff put in the work and was tenacious and all that, all these little clues that he's giving about educating and really going forward and trying things and taking the time. Go to, the, go to the Creative University website and you'll see the different kinds of things and the resources. There's lots of resources available. Send for the deck to, um, you know, to Louisa, as I gave you that email address, and we'll send you the deck that will give you some what I call homework, which is not, it's, it's curated for you guys with certain things that are a good start to begin, how to begin thinking about things. So with that, I'm gonna ask another question. Um, well, Glenn asks, what is the best way to gain a social media following? It, that's a good question. Now, here's what I'd ask, though. My question would be, are you trying to be talent? Or are you trying to create a brand, market a business? Because there's different ways. If you're trying to be talent, I mean, if you sing, then sing. You know what I mean? So I, it depends what you, it literally depends for the social media following. Because, and that's, that's a good question. Um, it depends what your ultimate goal is. Are, are you an athlete just trying to, trying, to, trying to create a following? What I always say to people, whether it be talent, athletes, um, executives, is that you're your own brand. You're a walking brand. So what you put up on social media is going to be representative of you, especially like if you're in high school. Because I, I actually, actually just, you know, I actually coach at um, Calabasas. I actually see one of my former athletes is on the chat um, tomorrow. Um, I actually coach and you have to be careful what you're putting on social media because you have to understand once you put it up, it's gone and, and to cyberspace, you're not going to get it back. But if you want to build a social media following, I mean, some of the, you know, you have one of, I guess a couple of things I say, you have to be consistent in your messaging. Like you can't post on Monday and then post three weeks later, you know, you need consistency. And there's a lot of free tools out there on how to even take your pictures and your video editing. Like, like for example, I have two phones. I have the big phone and on my phone, there's nothing but apps. Just like, there's literally nothing but video editing apps, social media app. 
And I and the reason I, I just do that in my spirit, like when I need to relax, that's my relax, and I'll take pictures. And my 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 athletes know that on a track team because we have a track team. Like I post, I take their pictures, and I'll do all kinds of stuff with it. I just do that for fun. But there's a bunch of free tools out there on how to make and optimize your images and things like that. But you do have to be consistent in what you're doing and what you're posting. Yeah, great answer. Um, so a question from Michael. Is it better to move where opportunities are or create opportunities within your community? Yeah, I would say yes, because you don't don't try to take on the world. I mean, you start small, start in your community, start on the block. I mean, so you have a better chance of creating opportunities in the community where you are. They can potentially grow exponentially and, and expand, but you absolutely think local first. Yeah. Okay. Um, Carol asks, are you familiar with XOD, the first black owned streaming network? I would say they're not the first black owned streaming network, but I'm not familiar with the XOD. Yeah, XOD. So, uh, from so, Carol. So, I, 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 looked, I looked it up earlier today because I wasn't familiar with it. And there is an XOD. I I don't know much about it, but yeah, I've never heard of it. Okay, so you're not familiar with it. I, I'll look it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my curiosity. So um, here's a, a really interesting one from Sherry. I'm interested in facilitating a conversation about mental health with the next generation that's actually funny and engaging. Suicide is taking too many of us out and I have a mission to save 2020 lives this year. Let's do it through laughter. It's more of a comment you know, than a question really, but it gets to with something that we start at the beginning of this session, which is the mental health issues and just what all you guys are going through. You know, the daunting challenge, I mean, my God, the world, if you guys didn't face enough challenges with all the other things, what what has been going on for the past many months? Um, but I don't know, do you have any? Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's a timing is, we're very focused on mental health and, and wellness. We're, we've actually partnered with Headspace, which is Headspace is a, um, yeah, you know, is an app and so, we partner with them and we're actually producing a series of um, short videos around mental health and meditating. It, they, they're gonna be light, funny, but you know, kind of trying to get the message out there. So we have, we've got a really good lineup, but we're like, we literally start shooting today. Like we started production today. So okay. we, we are definitely in that mental health space. Um, we actually also just fi finished a shoot with Kevin Hart for Snapchat that, that's around mental health and um, and motivation, there's small motivation, they're like there's 10 of them. So we, we were definitely in that space trying to use entertainment as a platform to speak to that because yeah, we are in, the times are different and mental health is a big issue um, out there. So we're definitely trying to address it, you know, from an entertainment standpoint. By the way, that's very cool. What great timing too. So <laughs> once you have anything available, let me know and then we'll, we'll share it with everybody who's part of Creative University. Um, and then we have just a limited period of time. We have a couple minutes, but a question from Joshua. What do you think the entertainment business will look like in the future? Pretty broad. Do you think that there will be a period of time where virtual performances will be the only type of performance? And how do you adapt to the changes to ensure you are making a profit? Very good question. What I would say is if virtual performance are the only performance we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with you completely. I, I think that be, that becomes part of the the ecosystem of, of experiential. But if if we're only if we're stuck with the virtual performances only, we're going to have bigger as a society as a nation. We're going to, because that means all your live events. I mean, your sporting events. That means your everything else. Your going to school. That means that that could impact. Everybody, so I pray that that never is the case, but but I think that will be part of what we start to see now. Um, in terms of um, how to monetize it, there are technologies out there. There's things happening. I'm seeing a lot of stuff online. I just and it's really going to take the consumer to to really. I mean, I don't. I, it, you, first of all, you know, as a consumer, you don't want to watch a Zoom concert. You want you want an experience. That could be in the future when it's a 3D or um, augmented reality experience, but you need some kind of experience that's going to get people to want to pay for it. It's something that's different that they know what to get. 
Yeah, I mean, it was pretty interesting. You had the Travis Scott Fortnite um, experience, and I think it was seen by over, we've talked about it before in these sessions, over 30 million people or something like that. And I, there's gonna be some big money that comes with that, but uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I, I kind of write about it a lot where, because we're so increasingly heads down and digital, there's this kind of like real human need for physical live connection. And even though we're shut, even though the concert business is shut down and we can't go to th those kinds of things right now, I think that it's going to come roaring back and it will only continue to grow long term. Um, I'm curious, and then and then we got to end it, unfortunately. But I'm curious what you think is going to happen to movies because you're in the movie business as well as to all kinds. What do you think is going to happen to the theater business? I think you now there's been a couple of articles about this. I think. Okay, th this is pending that we can all go back in the theaters and it's, and it's safe, right? It's pending that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you know, as you know, you just seen um, the studios. You know, Universal just collapsed the window on a, on a pay per view um, to seventeen days on a premium pay per view. But I, what I think people want to go out when there's big movies, people gonna want to go to the theater. There's certain stuff that you want to go to the theater to see. Um, and people want to go out with friends. It's like because also we, we're getting to a step, situation where you're not you're not even interacting with people. Like that's not good. Like just from a society standpoint. So I do, but I do think the model is going to change. I do think that, um, and I, I don't want to get so deep into it, but I think that the studios are going to have to potentially buy the theaters or partner with the theaters. Like, because with AMC and the Bridge, what they announced there's a partnership, they're going to have to be more of a partnership because the theaters will not be able to survive on their own. It's just a standalone, just based off uh, door revenue and concessions. So there's going to have to be some kind of joint. And it could, and it also, you, you might see the Netflix buying their own chain or the Amazon yeah. buy their own chain. That's, I think that's what I think is going to happen. Or Apple. I, 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 I totally agree with you. In fact, I think it was not that uh, maybe in the last month, Amazon bought a boutique movie theater. Yeah. And I think there's going to be more of that. Exactly. Uh, yeah, because it's just part of their overall engagement, just like Amazon bought Whole Foods and Amazon's exactly. building brick and mortar stores. It, it's just not, it's just another, it's just another touch point for Amazon and they will mark, you walk in the theater and you got all the Amazon products there. And all, like it, I could see totally Amazon buying a theater. Chain. No question. So listen, we're at the, we're at the hour. Um, we're going to make this available online, of course, on demand, because uh, we get a lot of people who have watched these on, on demand and it's a permanent archive, which is great because the advice that you have, Jeff, timeless, great, great anecdotes, um, cool career, very cool career. Good for you on everything. And really appreciate your time and participate in, participation in Creative University. Like it, it, it's great to have your stories. It's great to have your advice for everybody. So I look forward to continuing our conversations and, and thanks for joining us. Okay, appreciate it, appreciate it. Thank Thanks to everybody out there. We'll make this available online. Again, I urge you to go to the Creative University website to learn more about all the resources and opportunities because if you want it, you can get it. You can get internships and mentorships with some really, really interesting people. So go to creatv.media and uh, I'll, I'll just type it in. So you have the spelling of, of it. That is the website for my firm that's in the media and entertainment business. And then if you look on the tabs, you'll see Creative University and that's where it all sits, okay? So with that, thanks all. Okay, thanks a lot. Until next time. Okay, thanks. See ya.